from supper. I also said about being great to see people back in a live environment. Mm -hmm. And uh, I want to thank, before I go any further, thank everybody who's been part of organizing this this evening, especially the caterers, you all for coming, Dave Hodgson for bringing in an absolutely impressive um, amount of technical gear, and David and Mike Gerber for making the technology work. So well done on all of that. Never act with the uh, adults and children. Never try to teach with adults and children on technology. And the old military adage, remember, what can go wrong? So I hope nothing much will go wrong here, although I see we've got some interesting little dialogue box. I think this meeting is being recorded. Well, wow. goodness me, Mr. Putin's on us already. Got it. So, uh, with apologies to Paul Bradman, who has heard this talk before, because I will put it out to the ADF, the Army Development Fund, about uh, four years ago, I think now, at Forward. Uh, but uh, I think it's worth we only out again this year, 2022, because this year marks the 80th anniversary, a really pretty important year in the course of the Second World War, 1942. 1942 famously was described towards its close by Winston Churchill as not the end, not even, I think, the beginning of the end. This year is, I think, the end of the beginning. And, and he was able to say that because of the British and the Empire's great victory, which had been pulled off during the course of the last week of October and throughout November 1942 by the 8th Army in the desert under the command of Monte. Field Marshal, as he later became general at this time, Bernard Law Montgomery. Uh, so we're going to look at Monte and his men in the desert tonight. Uh, as I said when I spoke to the ADF in forward on this very subject some years ago, I don't intend to say anything tonight about Monte in Northwest Europe. Uh, I think you, some of you may be interested in that and tempted to ask some questions. And if you're extremely nice to me and perhaps talk to me a second time, I mean, I need to accept a question or two about Northwest Europe. But it is in many ways a different subject. And there's a very good book about Monty in Northwest Europe, which I put on display in the book display. Uh, I hope we will have a look at some of those books, but please make sure that they stay uh, in the UK. And that book is John Buckley's. Uh, Monty's men. Now, John Buckley did his degree and his PhD here in the United And he was uh, supervising director, you know, he's a good friend of mine. He was supervising director at Lancaster by another very good friend of mine, John Gooch. John Gooch was here in the days of all our good friend Martin Edmund. Uh, and John rose from lecturer in 1969, professor by the early 1990s, Dr. Bailroom. Before he moved on to uh, distinguish the next phase of his career at Leeds University, and he's now retired from the Matlock area. And John's been on the email with me in the last day to John Gooch. And John Buckley is one of his most stellar proteges, who is now professor and director of the War Studies Program at the University of Northampton. And there I've gone for a number of years in November of the Remembrance Tide to help them in teaching their adult learners Master's Day School part-time with intensive weekend of study. Why do I say all this? Well, because John Buckley's work on the Army in the Second World War is very important and overturns an awful lot of old stereotypes. He did a book on British armour in Northwest Europe, armour and tanks, which got to the heart of what was wrong with British tanks and British armour's uh, doctrine as late as the last year of the war. And if you think that the Russians have had problems in the last month in Ukraine with their armor, well, in some ways, it's nothing but a throwback to the problem the British in Normandy and Belgium and up to the Netherlands in 1944 45. Um, and so John Buckley followed that up with his book, Monty Men, which is a look more closely at the armies in Central Town Group, in particular in Normandy. And I commend his work very much to you if you're interested. In that latter phase of Montgomery's Second World War career. But tonight I want to talk about the desert because in 1942, Montgomery not only was really an unknown general, but he was also not destined to take over an Eighth Army. 
So let's, let's see if we can move forward and very rapidly find out why he was in the desert at all. Or we consider his qualities as a leader and particularly his and his army's triumph in that oh so neglected area of military studies and military operations, which is logistics. Amateurs, it's often been said, talk endlessly, and some of them write books about tactics, but professional military people, whether they're sailors, whether they fly things, or whether they be uh, in the green machine on the ground, or in this case, the sandy coffee machine, they do logistics, they do supply. And we're going to see really how absolutely crucial was Montgomery's foregrounding of supply and the problems and the sorting of those problems to achieving desert victory. So why was Monty in North Africa? Why were the British in North Africa? Well, the British were in North Africa in the first year or two of the Second World War to try to stop and stymie the ambitions of Mussolini and Mussolini in Italy. And John Gooch, who was at Lancaster, and John Buckley's uh, director of studies some 30 years ago, John Gooch really is Britain's expert now on the Italians in the Second World War. And before you go suggesting that that was the issue of that in a very short book, I, I can tell you, and, and let's, see, let's see, look, John Gooch is very good, I can tell you, it's two very major books by John. One about a dozen years ago called Mussolini and Generals. And the other, just last autumn, was one of their prize, which is called Mussolini's War. An all-round look, not just at the Italian army, as Mussolini and generals was, uh, but it's a look at the Italian Air Force, the Italian Navy, the Italian way in war. And he gets to grips in that book, his most recent book, Mussolini's War, with the vexed and tricky question of whether or not what Mussolini was trying to get the Italian armed forces, Navy, Army, Air Force, to prosecute, was a kind of fascist war. Was the Italian doctrine a fascist war? So the Italians were a much more important player in the years from 1940 to 1942. I think most people in the British world have recognized. We've been very much seduced by someone else whose uh, book is over there, and that is the Desert Fox, Rommel. Perhaps because you know, we made the film about it, didn't we? With James Mason playing Rommel in the eponymous Desert Fox film. But we've been obsessed with Rommel in the British uh, world. And I think we need to get away from that and realize Rommel was in North Africa because of the Italians. And the Italians' problems facing us, British, in North Africa, explain why Rommel was there. So the Italians have been creating an empire in the 1930s. Uh, they already had control of Libya from before the First World War. And then in the 1930s, they overran Ethiopia and forced out Haile Selassie and Anegas, uh, overrunning his entire country, his entire kingdom in East Africa, and forcing him to flight and refuge here in Britain. He was given sanctuary, in fact, on the Welsh English marches at what became a hotel. And my wife and I stayed very often, very nice little country house hotel, the Mild Brook House Hotel just outside Knighton uh, in, in the marches. And that was the home of Sir Wilfred Thesiger, the great Arabist and explorer. And Wilfred Thesiger had come to know Haile Selassie as a highly young man in the 1920s to 30s. And it was Thesiger who used his influence with the British government to get Haile Selassie's safe passage to Britain uh, at, at the end of the 30s when his country was overrun by the Italians. And then again worked on Churchill and the British government at a very dark time of the war for us in 1941, when things were going badly on all fronts, and really it appeared that the Axis, the German-Italian alliance, was winning. Uh, Thesiger was one of those who persuaded Churchill actually to detach a fairly small British expeditionary force from British Somaliland and from the Sudan to seize Ethiopia back. For Haile Selassie and to restore the Negus to the throne in Addis Ababa. And that we did in the most remarkable and successful combined air and ground operation in 1941. So we were busy engaged with the Italians well before Herr Rommel turned up. The British and Italians were at war. And the Italians were already displaying many of the problems with John Gucci's books, Mussolini's Generals and Mussolini's War, 
have brought out to the fore in the, the English literature in the last few years. And they've been able to, he's been able to explore the problems that face the Italians because he reads and speaks Italian and he's been to the Italian archives extensively. He's been months and months and months on several major research trips there over the last 15 years. And I have to say to you, that's the only way in which serious history gets done. And I look at our young colleagues from Lancaster University and you think that a lovely time because quite soon, I think it's next week, these damn students disappear. And they go, well, well first of all, they don't anymore, as uh, Sophie and Tom now were just saying, post grad students, masters and PhDs, they stay around and they expect more of you during the vacation time because you don't get so much of a chunk of tutors when all the undergraduates are there in turn time. So the students don't go anymore. But what the academics and all universities are actually required to do is to undertake research and to publish it. And a significant part of their department money for more than 20 years now comes from gradings given to the quality and quantity of the research that we produce. So that's how history actually gets made. It doesn't magically happen and suddenly, oh, there's an exciting new book in Waterstones. I think I'm a believer. We don't want to buy that. We're very pleased when you do, but it takes years and years and years to produce the product that you can buy. And Italy and its war have until recently been pretty neglected. And yet the Italians are worth studying because you might think, well, why did a country which committed such vast resources to its armed forces under a fascist regime struggle so much? It had millions of men under arms, the Navy, the Air Force, and particularly in the army. Uh, it had a conscription-based set of military forces, and it had a considerable empire and even more considerable ambitions for more. Well, the British were rather good at doing a lot, if not very much. They were good at improvising. They were good at making do and men. And one of the best of the British field commanders, and later, of course, an imperial proconsul, and the last but one viceroy of India, who demonstrated this and really cleaned the clocks of the faces of the Italians in 1940 and 41 was Archie Wavell. Archibald Wavell, I submit to you, was a great man. He was, as John Connell, his biographer, uh, put it in the title of his book, um, he was a scholar soldier. Wavell was a serious academic himself. He was a Winchester College man before the army, and he wrote the biography of Field Marshal Edmund Allenby, Hull, who was responsible, Allenby of Medjida, who was responsible for the clearance of Palestine and uh, Jordan and all those territories, Saudi Arabia, which are familiar to most Brits, I think, only now through uh, the, uh, the film of Barnes of Arabia, the David Lee movie in the 1960s. Well, Allenby was the man who really orchestrated that campaign, and if he interested because of Britain's empire in studying campaigning in vast desert open spaces, Wavell became the biographer of Allenby. And Wavell then had the opportunity with a force, the Western Desert Force, as it was called, not yet the Eighth Army, it was only about one corps strong, about three divisions, with the Western Desert Force in 1940 41. Wavell was able to chase the Italians out of Egypt and damn nearly out of Italian Libya too. So that was really clear evidence of the problems that the Italians were going to face in this war. They were perhaps a giant repeated play. Vast forces, but cumbersome, not organized well logistically, prone to jabbering on the radios so that uh, they were prone to British field signals intercepts, uh, today we call cyber warfare, but it was SIGINT in those days, and the Italians were in trouble. So the Germans, who were their allies, had to bail them out. It was the first time that the Germans had to, but it was certainly not the last. In February 1941, with a severe danger that Wavell's 30,000 was going to push further westward in North Africa, having cleared out uh, Egypt and what was called uh, Cyrenaica and still uh, eastern Libya, that he would push on Wavell to Tripoli itself and take the capital of Italian Libya, and that would be the end of the Italian position in Africa. Remember, at the same time, the British expedition was in the 
seizing the Italian traditions in Eritrea and Ethiopia and Somaliland and restoring them to the throne in Addis. So at that point, the entire Italian colonial project, the entire Italian dream of Mare Nostro, our sea, the Mediterranean, Italy to the north, Sardinia to the west, and the African colonies to the south, was crumbling. So Rommel to the rescue, Rommel to the rescue. The Germans send this very small force, the Deutsche Afrika Corps, DAK, initially just one panzer division and one light division, or what we would call a light mechanized division, desperately across the Mediterranean, north to south, by ship to the port of Tripoli in order to rescue the Italians, put some backbone into them, stiffen them up with guys who knew how to fight in the dungeon very successfully. Rommel, quickly, Rommel had won his spurs in 1940 in France. Rommel had commanded seven panzer divisions, one of ten with which the Germans had invaded France in 1940, known as the Ghost Division. Rommel and his men would pop up here and pop up there, and when you tried to counterattack them, they weren't where you thought they were anymore. They were fast, they were mobile, they were dynamic. Rommel was a leader from the front. Rommel exemplifies to me the great German skill of both world wars, that tactical leadership, and just about rising to the operational level of command. But Rommel, and we contrast, I hope I can show you tonight, dramatically with Monty, Rommel was in no shape or form of strategist. He exemplified the way in which German tactical successes on the ground in both world wars, time and again, amounted to nothing because they were not pieces, they were not Lego bricks in a grand design, in a strategy that made sense towards winning the war for Germany and the Axis. So it was all flash and it was glorious and it was highly successful for a time, but it didn't actually amount to anything, not in terms of substantive means to win the war. Some of the flash successes were very dramatic and very unsettling for the British. In April 1941, only two months after the lead elements of his Panzer Division and his Light Division landed at Tripoli, Rommel's advanced wrecking forces surprised and captured the two most senior British field commanders of the Western Desert Force. Richard O'Connor, the tactical architect of Wavell's 30,000 campaign against the Italians in the autumn of 1940, and Philip Neen, a VC holder from the First World War, um, and a tremendous slaughterer of big game in India in the war years. Well, it was a very boring time to be an officer unless you had a quarrel war and some wallers to take you on the howdahs on the elephants. Um, I do commend to you, I don't know where you find it up in my library around here, but I do commend you for the means remarkable memoir written in Italy in captivity, because they were both captives and sent to Italy in 1941. It means remarkable memoir playing with strife. Um, and uh, I don't know about playing, but it's something, it would certainly send shudders through David Attenborough. And it's richly illustrated with black and white photographs of this book in the middle part of it between the First World War and the uh, short account of Neen's campaign in the desert and his capture. Richly illustrated with the damage he did to the uh, four-legged wildlife of the Indian subcontinent. Very much a man of his time. And these two generals were captured in Rommel's very first advance across the Western Desert in the spring of 1941. So they swung across, I hope you can see, uh, a, 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 across the bulge around Benghazi, the sort of areas, the Gulf of Sirte, where we became very familiar with from, I suppose, 10 years ago, during 11 years ago, during the Arab Spring. But here's Rommel, you can kind of see a very charismatic man, young for a general, 51 years old, um, really sexy, movie star. You know, this is, this is, he was the business. Uh, he had the, the, the motorbike sunglasses, just to ride around on a motorbike. He wanted Steve McQueen, he was James Mason, just to get the films right. Um, so, so, yeah, he didn't go trying to leap over any barbed wire, any cool bar. He had a, a small, unique command staff. Around him, Fritz Byerlein, his chief of staff, very talented officer indeed, who again has left very interesting memoirs translated into English. Um, General Krutwell, um, and uh, these people with his staff car and small command team ensured that Rommel could keep moving and Rommel could lead from the front. 
long wasn't hide bound by fixed static telephone lines or some country house mansion in the rear in the way that traditional 20th century warfare had demanded. So Rommel, with his ghost division tactics in 1940, replayed the game again in the desert in 1941 and gave the British a tremendous runaround and re-energized the Italians, not all of whose forces were poor by any means. The Italians had some very fine tanks and, and mechanized divisions, the Trieste division, the Aviati armored division, better in slog matches against British tanks, I have to say, than were the uh, German tanks of the, of the uh, Panzer Corps. So the British were in big trouble and had to regroup and they had to replace those lost officers and they turned to a man from the Indian Army, another great man, I think, called Orkinlet. And Claude Orkinlet took over as commander in the Western Desert in the summer of 1941. To Brook, the port on the north shore of uh, Libya was left uh, besieged, but still held by the British. And that was crucial for something I do want to emphasize, I've already mentioned, which was the German and Italian supply block. Throughout 1941, Tobruk acted as a blocker along the Via Balbia, which was the one Italian road, in umbilical cord made with tarmac to stretch from Tripoli to Benghazi and all the way along the coast to the junction of Libya with Egypt, near Solon and what was called the Halbea Pass. British had called it a killing ground, the British quickly uh, labeled the hellfire parts. Uh, and that umbilical cord had fought in the lorries and lorries and lorries of supplies for the Italian forces and for the German Africa Corps became really the great weak spot of the Axis effort in North Africa and the most wonderful target for the rapidly reinforcing Western Desert Air Force. If again, you cast your mind back, what, two weeks for that stopped Russian mechanized and motorized force, column, whatever it was, still debating, I think, why it stopped exactly, because it's dispersed now, but why it stopped, 40 miles long. That, again, was nothing like so much as simply in the snow, a version of what happened time and time again to the German and Italian forces in North Africa in 1941 and 1942. And uh, forces like that are just trying out in conflict to be attacked and destroyed from the air. Now, the Ukrainians weren't able to do that to the Russian forces. The Desert Air Force that Britain possessed in the Second World War was able to do that to the Italians and Germans. So this, this route, I'm, I'm going to step back to the big screen and just try and trace it to the point that this route for the Abalbia ran up here from Tripoli to Alagala, to Benghazi, along the coast, putting the coast down, partly because it's an enormous Jebel Massif, Mount Desert Mountains all here, really impenetrable, then the Great Sand Sea itself. The coastal area was where the Italians had settled and colonized, and done some infrastructural work, canals and buildings and so on, some of the grandiose fascistic in the 1920s and 30s, and the road ran along the front of the world. Egypt here. So that became the umbilical corridor, the supply lifeline for the Africa Corps and their Italian allies. And it really was the main battleground. And the British were able to move not only through conventional warfare, but into the spectrum of what today is called unconventional warfare or special forces, special operations, not of the Putin kind, but SOS, special operations forces, only, because we formed two bodies. The SAS, Special Air Service, David Sterling's most famous achievement, and the LRDG with their Desert Scorpion at their back, the long range desert group formed by people like Paddy Main um, and the grandfather uh, of Chris Bagnall, who's the head of art and photography at the Royal Grammar School here in Manchester, Major Ray Bagnall. Bagnall and Paddy Main and the desert, the long range desert group were able with their half tracks and armored cars uh, and stripped down weapon system, their toughness, they were able to roar through the Great Sand Sea, relying upon resourcing themselves to want to do very, very isolated oases and move up and raid and attack the supply lines of the Italians and the Germans uh, unannounced uh, and surprise them. And they were also able to hit 
destroy parked up German and Italian aircraft at forward airfields that were designed to try to supply fire support in the air for the African Corps and the Italians. So now the Germans and the Italians knew that they got a very vulnerable southern or open desert plain to worry about as well. The whole problem was getting worse, and Monty hadn't even arrived. The Rommel's trying, if you like, and to push a boulder up a sand dune at this time. Any of you ever seen the famous 1958 movie, the most famous beer in film, Ice Cold in Alice? Yes, of course you have, with John Mills, Nancy Quayle, and Sylvia Sims. And that film shows you again and again the difficulty of moving off the road in the North African desert in World War II. They're trying to move that ambulance across the Great Sound soon. Well, you try to do anything like that without being properly prepared for it, and you're in deep, deep trouble. So Rommel counterattacked again in 1942. The battle of the North African desert had a kind of seesaw quality to it. He attacked again in 1942, having been reinforced by Hitler by a, with a second panzer division. So he now had the 15th panzer division and the 21st panzer division, and still his light mechanized division, semi motorized, semi mechanized, the 90th light division. Three, three divisions one motorized, two panzer, some paratroopers, one brigade of uh, of paratroopers under a man called Baron von der Heidt uh, and the Italian. Well, despite that, Rommel's imaginative, bold, from the front, can do its leadership, ensured that once again the British and Commonwealth forces were pushed back to the border, initially to the border with Egypt, to the, to the junction point. Uh, and in that, in a great climactic battle in June 1942, around uh, the small desert town of Gazala, what was a First World War style slug of a battle, a nutritional battle that lasted over a week, Rommel eventually broke the British and Commonwealth position. But at tremendous cost in tanks and vehicles destroyed, and lives lost, and men wounded on his own side. And by this point in 1942, 80 years ago, really 80 years ago, next month, the month after, the war was already turning, though few people, I think, were able to discern this at the time in favour of the Allies. Because Rommel and the Africa Corps, and to a significant extent now the Italians, could no longer afford to absorb and more importantly replace life for life the losses that they were sustaining, especially in slugfest battles such as those around the defenders of the Zala line. This was, make no doubt about it, a really attritional, brutal fighting. The British had had time in uh, March and April and into early May, I suppose, to, to dig what were called battle boxes, uh, make huge sand berms with bulldozers, lay minefields with killing zone corridors between them, which only the British knew uh, the location in the desert, and position their infantry units and anti tank guns. <laughs> In mutually supporting interlocking giant, you know, mile square battle boxes on what became known as the Gazala Line. And perhaps at this stage, the British weakness was that the British were still thinking too much about positional warfare, though they were increasingly well supplied to sustain it. But the British weakness was also that their tanks, which were designed to counterattack when the Germans had exhausted themselves fighting the defending boxes. The British tanks were still of very poor quality, and they were not always terribly well read. And there are some, some very serious issues coming out in this middle period of the Desert War, which would still be challenging the British Army in Normandy and beyond into Holland and Belgium in 1944. And that is what John Buckley has written about in his books on armour in Normandy and his Monty's men. So again, in tactical terms, Rommel and the Germans still had the edge, but increasingly the big battalions were on the British side. And by the summer of 1942, now I don't, I don't know whether I can manage to make this work, but I hope that by the summer of 1942, the battle was in danger of stalemating North Africa. 
as in danger in some ways that worked for the British. The British needed a victory, that's true, but the Germans, the Axis by this stage, needed one much more desperately. This was not a theatre of war that Hitler had ever intended to open up. It was only there because the Italians had needed the, the Germans in 1941. So at this point, there's something of a lull in the summer of 1942, with the Germans and the Italians had pushed the British all the way back towards the Suez Canal, only about 60 miles west of Alexandria, and the war settles down for a little while. And that, of course, and if I can get this link to work, I do not know, then we'll, we'll see. But it's when the most famous of the uh, wartime songs, I think, uh, came about. I don't know whether I'm going to be able to, to get this to go up as I want. Yes, right. Let us try. Let us see. Uh, it's not looking terribly positive. It worked on my computer at home. I think we'll just have to go back and go from the current slide. Anyway. I well, we could. Well, yes, we could. We could. We need a female voice, of course. Somebody with a husky kind of sort of tone. Because this was not famously a song, Lady Marlene. The point is that it was in this stalemate adopted by both sides. It was a German song. It had first been recorded in 1939. It had been written in 1937. It was made famous by being played over German forces wireless. And uh, nobody referred to radio in those days, of course. Um, but it was played in German forces wireless during this stalemate in the desert. Uh, and sung uh, uh, by Lael Anderson. It was later perhaps made more famous by Marlene Dietrich, but Lael Anderson was the originator. And the uh, British uh, song craftsman soon turned the words into the British, into English as well. Uh, both sides ended up liking this. And you know the tune very well, you can probably hear it in, in your heads. And it was extremely popular. And it's a song for uh, a girl, or it's Inevitably, it's about the prostitute outside the barracks, outside underneath the lamplight by the barrack gate, and the poor longing young soldier, of course, is waiting for Lily to come along for an assignation with him each evening. Of course, I think she's got there in other bows who are pursuing her. Um, both the sets of extremely isolated, far from home, sweltering in the heat soldiers sort of conjured up their own mental images of Lily Marlena. So, this is a bit. Yes, I think, yes, I think she's probably coining it by this term. Um, <laughs> selling well for both sides, uh, at least the song. And in this lull, with the soldiers listening through the crackly with the wireless sets and sweltering well over 100 Fahrenheit heat, loading the gun, moving towards the fires, trying to keep the sand out of all the vehicles, change the filters for the engines and so forth, along Pamplante, because the British have got somebody, of course, at the very top of their war effort, just as the Germans have Adolf Hitler, the British have got Winston Churchill, who is also a very impatient man, and Churchill wants results, and Churchill is extremely intolerant throughout the war of all generals, and indeed admirals, who don't bring him results. Churchill's an instant gratification kind of a guy, isn't he? Um, and he wants to know what people are doing, or why aren't they getting on with it? So he wants a general who will get off. He thinks Rommel is great, but we need a British answer to Rommel. The man he picks on is a little bit unlikely. It's Monty. Well, Monty had not commanded in the field since he was in charge of the 3rd Infantry Division, one of the 10 divisions that made up the British Expeditionary Force in France before Dunkirk. Since then, he had been in charge of various parts of the Home Army Command, defending the British Isles in 1940 41. But he was a major general, and he was suddenly promoted to be field army commander uh, of the 8th Army of the Western Desert Force that morphed into during 1941 under Wavell and then in 1942 under all. And Monty's now put in charge. And Monty and Rommel are the kind of yin and yang of the Second World War, of the Desert War. They're two sides of the same coin in many ways. Uh, though in crucial respect, and that is logistics and strategy, they're not at all cut from the same clock. We've just lost. Oh, David. That's not much have gone. Well, I will carry on, and you will have to. It is a Russian cyber attack. 
but we've got Monty. They've only got Vlad the Invader. Is a is the end of the battery then? Eh? Or a power? Yes, we have the technology. So I'll talk about Monty for a minute. Monty was a very distinguished Royal Warwick officer in the First World War. He badly wounded several times on the Western Front. He ended up commanding the battalion of Royal Warwick in the war years. He was a very complex, conflicted individual, absolutely sure of himself, very small, very wiry, very short. Sadly, sadly lost his wife uh, to illness in uh, 1937. Uh, and was a man of real OCD obsession. He was an obsessive repulsive kind of a man. He was obsessive about the appearance of his troops, and he was obsessive in a way that officers were not at that time, about the health of his troops. Uh, this had come out in France in 1940, and before again in North Africa. Monty was going to make damn sure they didn't stop with any Lily Marlenas, let alone any of the ladies of the night. Thank you very much. Uh, let alone any of the ladies of the night in Cairo on leave behind the lines in the, in, in the Delta. Uh, he was obsessed with uh, sexual transmitted diseases, VD among the men, um, good hygiene and health. And he personally gave lectures to uh, the men and the officers about this. But that is not all that Monty did. Monty gave lectures and briefings to all of his officers down to the rank of the uh, colonels commanding all of the battalions and everybody up from them to the army command. So all the brigadiers, all the divisional major generals, and his three corps commanders, Lumsden, Lees, and Horrocks, in the run up to the Battle of Second Alamein that was launched on October 1942. And that was totally new that an officer should understand the British Army. But the way to get people playing as an orchestra to the same tunes as you had conceived as the uh, composer and conductor in chief of the piece, that was new. That was not the traditional top down, remote control British way of running military campaigns. And that was really where Monty, the leadership, came to the fore. Yes, he was quirky, he had all these strange obsessions. And he was prickly and he was offensive, especially to politicians and about to the politicians, uh, about officers, senior generals, whom he can break. Um, and uh, he would not be backward in telling Alan Drook, chief of the Imperial General Staff, and Churchill was senior military advisor during the war, uh, or Churchill himself, that, um, you know, we have to be there good. Get rid of him. Um, yes, I have no confidence in him. Yeah, send him to India. That you could send him to India, but I would do. The Japanese are knocking at the doors in India. So he might be sent to command some kind of training base up in the Scottish Islands or uh, to the British West Indies or somewhere out of the way. But Monty was ruthless. Monty was offensive. Monty was dynamic. And Monty was motivational. And that was all very new. So he had had a very distinguished First World War, a distinguished campaign in 1940, and he had a very distinguished Second Battle of Alamein. But, you know, he knew how to pick subordinates with great skill and care. And once he was persuaded that you were his man and that you got, you understood not only his scheme and his plan, because he explained it to officers down to left hand internal level, once he was persuaded you had got it, um, even more importantly, that you would execute the plan and with discretion, but within the plan, something close to present day mission command, he backed them to a hill and he would go to battle against Brook or more pertinently against Churchill on behalf of his senior commanders uh, who he trusted. And that, of course, worked two ways. Senior officers knew Monty wouldn't hang them out to dry. Once you were one of, quote my full title, Monty men, whether you were a private squad in the desert or you were a lieutenant general commanding one of the three corps, 10th corps, 13th corps, 13th corps, you knew Monty had in today's vernacular got your back. He would stab you in the back, he got your back. And that was hugely, as many of you served, gentlemen, you and ladies, you know, that's hugely important to making any organization function 
properly, especially under all the stresses and duress of a very difficult campaign like this. And so Monty was really a winner in that regard. I don't know why we've got this awkward, uh, low system resources affecting us in the middle. This must be another sort of form of cyber attack, I think, here. Don't know how to get rid of it. Anyone know how I might get rid of that without losing the slide? A little cross. We've all got crosses to bear. Well, I find one there. Like me. Mm -hmm. Let's try it with the with the mousey gadget, shall we? That's it. Yeah. 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 Why on earth? Thank you. David, fantastic. Thank you. Why, Mr. Gates, we need that interruption. I don't know. Maybe Gates works for Putin. Hey, it's a thought. It is a thought. I leave that with you. So I, I want to emphasize the quality of the four commanders. Um, Lee's Horrocks. Some of you, I dare say, certainly it's my vintage, you'll all remember all our yesterdays on Sunday afternoon, wonderful program with Brian English, 25 years to the week, each weekend from the Second World War. So we had 1952 in 1967. Monty actually went back to that group in 1967, guest at the Sunday Times, he went in full field martial uniform, by the way. Uh, and uh, he was um, a bit mass dated then. Uh, and he doesn't really look at, uh, at all different. And I managed to get a great photograph for him in the Sunday Times to tell a magazine, which I've still got. A great photograph of him standing there in the funeral hall, my first look at it, with his cap on, the red band, and uh, looking at the rusty, burnt out hull of one of the German tanks. This is in August 1967. Um, whether or not the, some Ukrainian general will be taken you know, in about 30 years' time to see the rusty. Uh, hull of some Russian tank remains to be seen. I shan't see that, but one or two of you youngsters may. So these core commanders, Horrocks, who became a TV star, uh, a tremendous man. Uh, Lees went on to command 8th Army after Montgomery, 8th Army in Italy, again, a tremendous general. And Lumsden, 10th Corps commander, an artilleryman by trade to start with, and then an armoured specialist. He had most of the 8th Army's tanks. And he was the president, 10th Corps commander. So now look, whoa, what's going on here? This is where I ask you a question. Right, who wants to tell me about this? Why have we suddenly got a picture of the USS New Mexico, the Super Dreadnought class battleship, completed in 1918 and scrapped eventually in 1948 in the East of the United States? And who is the gentleman on the right? Anyone want to get the shot of that? No, I agree. Sorry, it's a bit long way away. If I tell you it's Admiral Sir Bruce Fraser, Lord Fraser of North Cape, who in, on Boxing Day 1943, commanding the home fleet, sank the Sharn Horse off North Cape, Norway, and then Baron Fraser of North Cape, removed Germany's last viable capital ship. So that's Fraser. Uh, at this point, Fraser is in command of Britain's newly reconstituted Far Eastern fleet. And the day here is what, what nine years later, be my birthday, 6th of January 1945. And that is the New Mexico, and that is being struck by kamikaze off the Philippines. And on the bridge of the New Mexico, very impressive structure high up there, on the bridge of New Mexico was the Admiral, the Captain and his staff, and the visiting drips. The new commander of our Far East fleet, Admiral Bruce Fraser, and General Sir Herbert Lumsden. Yes, the Defence Corps Commander Dalman in 1942. And the Kamikaze hit Portside Ridge, killed 29 sailors, the New Mexico's captain, and Herbert London Herbert uh, did not touch. He was just across the bridge wing, so he was what, 78 feet away, that's all, on the starboard side of the bridge wing, uh, did not touch uh, Ruth Fraser. And Lumsden thereby became the most senior officer of any service killed in the Second World War. 6th of January 1945, kamikaze attack on the US battleship New Mexico, where he was visiting before the landings on the Philippines. So I think it's very pointed, therefore, to, to, to speak to this, that even the generals in the Second World War 
uh, perhaps especially in the Second World War, not chateau bound as in the First World War, ran very considerable dangers. Horrocks was wounded not only several times commanding Italian military regiment in the First World War, but he was also wounded very badly in, uh, in uh, the North Africa and in, Italy in the Second World War. So the, these guys were every bit as much as the German generals like Rommel. These were really front commanders. And so if amateurs talk about tactics, professionals talk about logistics, and British leadership, I think, has easily been underestimated. I hope I've given you food for thought about how much better it has become by 1942 than it was. And I think it deserves to be recalibrated. And so does the British military's logistics effort. This is really where we won the Second World War. We took logistics seriously and professionally in a way that the Axis forces, all three Axis powers, Japan and Italy as much as Germany, did not. They did not take that mantra that professionalism in logistics is, as General Sir Julian Thompson, he of the Portland Commando, uh, gave his book over there, put brilliantly, logistics is the lifeblood of war. If you have not got the right caliber of ammunition in the right quantities with the right weapon systems at the time you need it, you might as well not have the weapon system. If you have not got the fuel of the right type for the vehicle in the right place, and which one is at the point that the fuel, that the weapon system, the armored uh, command is needed, you might as well not have the tanks. Rommel's tanks uh, of the Panzer Dragoons were down to five kilometers of mobility on their fuel on the Alamein line by the beginning of October 1942. So badly interdicted has been that the Abalvia umbilical cord of supply trucks supposedly bringing forward fuel all the way, all the way, 1,200 miles from Tripoli along the coast of Cyrenaica into Egypt and all the way up to the Alamein line, all the while being harassed and interdicted by the Desert Air Force. And what has never been properly understood by most students of the Second World War in North Africa is, of course, that the vehicles convoying forward for Rommel and the Italian all that fuel were themselves using up more fuel than they could carry. So I offer a little hint and an encouragement to you to come and uh, hear Brian's lecture on uh, uh, the uh, Vulcan operation to Stanley. But this is finally where you begin to understand how important is long-range logistics. Uh, you have to be able to do fuel and you have to be able to use fuel that is good. And that's true of those Vulcans and Victors heading for Stanley 40 years ago. And it's absolutely true that the Germans and the Italians couldn't do it in the desert 80 years ago. So the Allies got the logistics right. And that was the result of Monty's great success and then led to his campaigns that swept Rommel right out of Africa. And between them, Montgomery from the east, and after November 1942, Kenneth Anderson with Operation Torch, the landings in French North Africa, from the west in Algeria and Tunisia, crunched the Germans between unstoppable forces from left and right. The pincers closed on Panzer Army Africa, and by April 1943, the last remnants around Tunis and Deserta had had to surrender. Monty did indeed, as he had promised Churchill, what one more right out of Africa. And he, it was, who enabled Churchill to say famously in the House of Commons that we had brought about a great victory in the, in the desert, thanks to Monty's efforts. And you remember Churchill said, always playing a little fast and loose with the truth, but nonetheless, there was truth in it, that before Alamein, we never knew a victory. After Alamein, we knew a you don't want to take questions if you have any. I thank you for Yes, please. Um, Two questions. Can you tell us about the chap who Monty would play? The chap killed in an airstrike. Secondly, will you comment if the Germans, like the Japanese in Burma, uh, factored in capturing 
petrol and other supplies into the plant? Right. Excellent questions. I thought about mentioning 